One of the other things that happens in this period here is that we start to see a lot more use of a particular type of steel. So I'm just going to clear the board and put that other one up. So we're picturing now between say about the 1860s through to definitely the 1910 period. We, we really start to analyze how we make our steels and what sorts of alloying processes take place. Now there are some steels that were well known. First off, let's define steel again to make sure we understand what we're talking about. What is steel? Yeah, be an engineer. What's, what is it? Okay. It's an alloy. All right. What is it an alloy of? Iron. Iron, which is the base material. And? You can put a lot of things into it, but basically it's going to be one of these first two. You can certainly add a lot of other things. What's the other one? Carbon. Carbon. Now, the combination of those two things dates well and truly back into antiquity. The main way that used to be done was a process called wrought iron, where you beat the carbon into the surface. Other processes had been known of where you can soak the hot metal in certain materials. Nitrogen rich materials would do the same thing. Urine would do that because it's nitrogen rich. And it would introduce nitrides into the surface and harden the steels. Sword making and, and blade making relied on a knowledge of the imprint of another material into the steel to create an alloy. Because what happens with the alloy of the, of the iron, iron is the pure material. It tends to be soft and ductile and malleable. All right, soft meaning that it can indent really easily. It's got good formability because those two things are the formability, so it's good for that. But it's really not going to be useful as a sword or a plowshare or something like that because the rocks in the ground when you're plowing would be enough to bend it and you'd have to keep sharpening it and keep tidying it up. A sword and hit another guy with the same sword. For a long time, iron, even though it was well understood or at least known about, was not being used for that sort of thing at all. Uh, bronze was being used. That's an alloy of, uh, of brass, uh, alloy of copper. Um, bronze would be harder than iron by itself. So you'd have a better chance in a surviving uh, a battle if you had a bronze sword rather than an iron sword. But some people started to understand this process in the you know, 1200s, uh, Middle Ages, started to make swords, particularly in China, in Japan, really well good, good swords that would be able to benefit you and you become the masters of your area on the basis of your weaponry. Steel then is an alloy of carbon and iron. How much carbon? Very low. Why is it very low in percentage? So it's a low percentage. We'll get to why it has to be low in a second because it changes if you get too high. Why just the percentage? What's the real reason? Is there a lot of carbon in steel? Comparatively not. But there is quite a bit to make a difference. The difference is that if you looked at the size, the geometry of the iron atom, you can imagine it to be, you know, that fuzzy ball thing. It's a decent size. And then you've got another iron connected to it. So you've just got basic ferritic iron. When you start to put the carbon in, the carbon is a smaller atom. So it's going to fit into the spaces between it. But there are only so many spaces. But if we are comparing percentage by weight, you can have 20, well, it won't be 20. You look on the, have a look on the periodic table and compare the atomic weights. And you'll see that a low percentage will actually be quite a number of carbon atoms because they're smaller and lighter. So even though it might be only 5%, 2%, 1%, there's quite a bit of carbon involved. All right. What is this called when you do this? When you've got a lattice that has been formed and it creates your structure, in that case, a cubic structure perhaps, because there's a cube going on here. 
and this would be the cube with the edges so probably in this case it might be there might be another one in the middle here it could be a face centered cubic or it could be a body centered cubic form right those are the two main forms for iron we'll talk about those in a second okay what is it when you put the stuff in between called when you're alloying that way there's only two ways you can really do it i'll give you the first one i take an atom out and i put another atom in substitutional yeah so i'm substituting one for another but for that to happen they have to be relatively the same size and relatively the same in ability to chemically combine nacl being ionic creates that and they're very close to each other in size because one's donating the, sh the outer shell electron and reducing its overall size and the other one's gaining and filling that last shell and they come out to be pretty much the same size even though they're different when they're separated that lets them pack together in a nice neat cube and that's your basic structure for salt NaCl right. this one when it's in the spaces interstitial in between the spaces and what happens too is as the lattice contracts the influence of that being trapped inside generates an issue for what we need to use in order to deform how does a material deform okay slipping yeah the dislocations and slipping slip planes so that it can move across so whole sections can travel relative to each other Remember the pack of cards concept, that each layer slides and you can move the pack of cards over and it'll stay there. Permanent deformation. Right? The other one is that there's actually a space already there and it unzips along that space to get rid of the space and reduce that stress that's created there. So when you add force, it actually says, oh good, I can run downhill now and get into a lower state. What is the problem when you start to use those up though? The mechanisms, slip and dislocations. Why does it get brittle? Because it can't deform. Up. It's running out of opportunity to deform, so it can't do it. It's the mechanism's going out of the road. A lot of metals will do that. They'll use up their dislocations and get hardened. Okay? But we can force a different type of hardening into the metal if we make it difficult for those slip planes and dislocations to continue it's by putting things into the lattice that have to be jumped over in order for the slip to take place. So by applying this to it, I can change the property. I can make it harder. Ductile, malleable, when I put carbon into it, I make it harder. Now there is a problem though. Too much carbon and the carbon starts to join with the carbon. It's not interested in joining with the iron, so it starts to form graphite free carbon within the material. When you start freezing it out of the liquid, even though the carbon's mixed in the liquid, the carbon will start to join. And that's a percentage that's quite high to get to that. It's gotta be around three, four, five percent. Once you start getting there though, you might start to find you get bigger places of carbon, and this carbon is actually growing into something itself, pushing a whole lot of iron atoms to the side eventually you'll get to a place where the carbon will dominate and that's not good because it creates slip areas and weaknesses within the material because graphite forms generally as plate-like and they will break very easily the other alternative is you get to a chemical compound where you get a decision made by the iron and the carbon that the best thing for them both is to join chemically and that's done with a covalent bonding and you get iron carbide. Why it's called, it's, it's a compound is it's got a chemical formula, Fe3C. So when you have to one carbon, three iron atoms, the preferred energy situation is to create an ionic, bo a covalent bonding between those two things. And that becomes a really, really hard material. It stops behaving like a metal at all. Even though the majority of it might still be iron, you think, well, it's still a lot of iron, not much carbon, but we've reached a point where the carbon now is taking over some of the normal ductility and malleability properties of the iron. 
even stops it from being very good at conducting things. Electricity stops the feed. It's a very hard material. It's an intermetallic compound. And it's basically a whole new ball game. Remember when we talked about last year defining materials on the basis of whether they're metals or non-metals? And the decision to make, the, to make a difference between what's an alloy and what's a compound? The end result is that the alloy, the definition we used was an alloy is two or more materials chemically combined in such a way that it remains with its metal properties. And what are metal properties? Shiny on a cut surface, conductivity, malleability, ductility, density generally, they're fairly dense because they pack down, electrical and thermal conductivities. Now if it doesn't, it, it might have metal in it, but if it doesn't have those properties, it's no longer an alloy. It becomes a compound. All right, so that brings in the iron carbon diagram. And we should be able to get this to fire up. And we'll have a look at it on the screen. You've got copies of this from last year. This one I've just quickly grabbed off the net. With the control, yeah. Just answer the door there quickly and we'll see what she needs while this is firing up. And... Is that your bamboo stuff, is it? Uh, all right. Here we go. Make that smaller. Move it over here and make it larger. All right. You really do have to be very familiar with this and comfortable with it. First thing we've got is the iron down the side here. This is pure iron. We don't worry about the pure iron because until you start adding carbon to it, nothing really important changes. The iron has the name generally given to it as ferrite based on the, the old Latin word for iron and the symbol Fe is from ferrite. But when you start to add carbon, you start to get these sorts of things taking place. Areas. What are they called again, these areas? I'll give you a clue. The definition was physically distinct, chemically homogeneous. Yeah. Right, a phase. You jumped in quick before I finished. Yes, physically distinct, chemically homogeneous, mechanically separable portions of materials. So when I look in there, I'm going to see something that is different, that is physically distinct. Then I look at it chemically and I find it's all the same thing, chemically homogeneous. And I can pull little pieces of it apart from other little pieces of it. It's mechanically separable. If there's more than one thing happening, it's a multi-phase material. Now, when it's coming down here with a little bit of carbon, you get a single phase forming. Let's go through the process again, just to be sure that we've got it. Liquid all up here. See the blue line there? That, that line is the liquidus line, the barrier between liquid and something else. Below that line is something taking place. In this region and in this region, there is not the same here. It's interesting, but there and there and there, there is mushy. What's mushy all about? Liquid and solid. So it hasn't frozen in one temperature. It's frozen over a time frame. But eventually, wherever you come through, eventually you'll reach this other line. This one here. That is the solidus line. And you can follow it through from that point right down, all the way down, across here. And anything below that line is solid. Now, what kind of solid? Well, as you bring in the carbon content, for a moment or two, a moment or two, it's really not that at all, it's the temperature and relationship at the top, there is a capacity for the iron to hold a certain percentage, and it's very small percentages, like 0.06 or 0.08 percent carbon, really small. And for a while it forms this new material, a gamma iron, which has the name austenite. It's a twofold name. Austenite. Most of the steels that we're going to look at will be in this area here, down in this side here, coming through the austenite range. 
At a certain point, though, the austenite itself starts to break down. The face-centered cubic structure reverts back to an even smaller body-centered cubic. But now you can put atoms into a different place, and the carbon starts to come out but it doesn't come out by itself. What it starts to do is it comes out as the intermetallic compound, way over here. In fact, it's a little bit further over here. This diagram should continue on, and there'll be a straight line here, which is what the cooling point is. It's a freezing point because it's a single compound. Just like there is a freezing point for ferrite, there is a freezing point for no range, freezing point for iron carbide. Now, the iron carbide comes out of the gamma ion and the rest becomes ferrite. This area in here, this tiny little kind first formed, the first formed alpha ion. Remember all this? All right, now, the big thing you have to remember is that when you start moving across, generally speaking, you are going to get, in terms of strength, if I drew it, it will go from the softest form of the ion and it will start to climb towards the hardest forms. So you stop, it gets hard, the ductility decreases, but its ability to hold loads goes up. Its toughness might go up as well to some degree. But then the carbide coming in starts to impact and you drop off in the strength and it particularly drops off way over here into the carbon steels, or the um, car, what will become the cast irons, rather, in mean the high carbon steels. See this point here? What's that called, where it does that? This one is the eutectic, yes. And it's the eutectic because it's going from liquid into a solid. But what's the eutectic all about? What was that? Why is that so important to us? What's the big deal with it? Well, there's no mushy. Yes, good. So there's a freezing point. That freezing point might still take time. It's an arrestment because not everything happens all at once. But the big deal is it's the lowest temperature for those two materials. So why would that be important? Look across here you're looking at just over 1100 degrees. Up here though, 1500 degrees. Now you might not think that's very much, but in terms of being able to produce that sort of temperature easily, that's quite difficult to do. You have to have a lot of air blowing through your fuel, you have to have a, a containment that can get hot enough to handle it. You need a blast furnace. You need a furnace that is bigger and better than your just ordinary oven on your stove. You still need that for here too, but you don't need as much energy to do this. So for a long time, the experiments were to try and get to a place where you could cast, pour, cast the molten material at lower temperature. And that's why the eutectic is important. This becomes castable iron. Hence the term, cast iron. What happens either side of this is crucial too. As you come further this way, the first formed material will be the iron carbide. The second form will be the austenite on this side. What's over that side? If I go across here, what do I run into? austenite. But then when I reach this point, all the austenite must turn into this layered structure. This layered structure that's going to be the eutectic structure. That will continue on down till you get to this line here. And something happens at that one. 727. Now you have to form the eutectoid structure. And the whole thing changes again. And the confusion that takes place as a result of where things are creates issues for this type of material that weaken it. So we tend to want to stay closer to this range over here. We compromise on what we want in terms of temperature to get castable steels. And those castable steels have different properties. 
And I'll just run through a couple of them. Let's just remember a couple of the terms. Low carbon steel. Low carbon steels are those that are up to 0.15%. So they're down, if that's 0 0.5, 0.15% is down in this region here. Anything that side. Very, very little carbon, mostly ferrite. Mostly ferrite, and you can get a little bit of perlite happening if you like. The next one is the mild steels. Now, what's that sound like? Mild steels. Would you use the word mild when you, what, what, mild in a, it's a mild day. What do you mean by that? Medium. It's a medium day. Yeah, it's not, it's not one thing or the other. It's, it's not hard, it's not soft, it's somewhere in between. It's the kind of steel you might apply for using in reinforcement bars or in bendable materials. You want that flexibility in it and you want to be able to cut it reasonably easy. You don't want it to be so easy to bend that you can just bit somebody walk up and bend it. You see, you want some stiffness in it. So you might apply that to um, uh, some industry areas. Like you could use those mild steel things for car bodies and framing, a tubular steel for a bike. Strong enough and stiff enough if you keep it thick, but easy to work. All right. Next group after that, and medium carbon steels. Oh, that was up to uh, 0.2. Uh, percent. So we're still down in this region here. We're still right down in this region here. That's mild. The medium carbon steels will go just over the 0.5. So somewhere about there. So mild, up uh, mild, uh, low carbon, medium carbon. Now once you get up to the next group, high carbon steels, these are the eutectic steels, uh, eutectoid steels. Those are in this region here. And that's where you start to have, as I said, you get strength coming up and then it starts, well actually it goes a little bit further and peaks and then it starts to drop off. And after that is the tool steels. And the tool steel upper limit is around 2%. Right, where have I drawn that? It should be further over. So somewhere about 2%. So that hardness scale would come way over there. All right, so there's a rise going up, hardest steels, and then it starts to drop off as you start to get into the castable irons. So keep those sorts of, um, sort of feel for it. So the bit, the majority of them are to the left. Oh, we lost our picture. Right, go back. No, nope. ah, there we go. Um, most of them are to the left of the eutectoid. What's to the left coid called? There's a name for it. Eutectoids, left of the eutectoid, above the eutectoid, below the eutectoid. It's a phrase might show, show up in an exam, don't be scared by it. Hypodermic, hypo, hypodermic, under the skin, all right? So below, below the eutectoid, hypo eutectoid, hyperspace, in Star Trek, hyperspace, beyond space, over the top, hyper eutectoid steels, so you're High carbon tool steels, hyper eutectoid steels, your dead mild, mild, low carbon steels, and, and the mid range medium steels are all hypo eutectoid steels, below the eutectoid. All right? Um, what else do we need to be aware of? <coughs> okay. When you start looking at just the cast irons, I can get rid of this now. Just looking at the cast irons, there are two or three different types of cast irons. And you can control how they form by what other materials you might add to it. What your alloying process allows you to add other atoms as well that can manipulate the situation to hold back the formation of graphite or promote the formation of graphite. With um, steels, you can add things like chromium, um, and molybdenum and other things like this to increase the hardness or change the way it oxidizes. So you start to produce things like stainless steel where the surface doesn't oxidize the same as ordinary steels. So you avoid the rusting problem. I mean, they will still eventually start to deteriorate and corrode, but it's slower, slows the process down. So by adding other materials in, you can alter those things as well. But with one of them, with the carbon steel, the, with cast irons, you can get, let's have a look at, 
a photomicrograph. All right? It's just pictures. Photomicrograph is just a story with a, looking at the material. If you look at a cast iron and you see large areas of carbon between the grains, the grain is a weak area anyway because you're not actually getting the atoms to hold the atoms together. They slide over each other or pull apart at those points. And the graphite, if it forms as graphite, can itself be a weakening device. It doesn't have to be at the grain boundary. Sometimes it can form within the grains. So you get some feathery sort of carbon appearing inside them. When you see that on a microscope, the overall effect of the, the gray or the blacker carbon is that it grays up the carbon, grays up the steel. When you looked at, um, let's say, a eutectoid steel, what will you see in a eutectoid steel? The structure of a eutectoid steel is that perlite. Perlite is a structure where you had some ferrite coming out and then some iron carbide coming out. So the grains sort of have that original grain structure from the austenite that was formed first, but the eventual structure tends to look like that sort of pattern of lines inside, sort of mirroring the original grains. And it's that layered structure where each layer is one or the other. So it's ferrite or iron carbide. And they're layered on top of each other eutectoid structure. If you go hypo-eutectoid, below the eutectoid, what did it look like? You still have this eutectoid somewhere in it, but you might have bigger crystals of the original or some, uh, some of the ferrite that is formed, and then the eutectoid sort of in that sort of arrangement inside between things. And the large crystals here would be your iron ferrite. Come to the other side, and it may look similar to some degree, not quite the same in its formation, but you'll have your ferrite, uh, no, your perlite structure appearing, and there'll be areas where it's sort of white and appears white. And that those areas will be the iron carbide this time the iron carbide being a clearer material at this point. Now, once the carbon comes out, you start to change the appearance and color of the surface. And they start defining the kind of cast iron on those colors. White heart cast iron, gray cast iron. Those terms are more about the look of the material when it's broken on its surface. Gray cast iron is quite a common one. So when you break a piece of cast iron and it has that gray sort of look to it, not silvery look to it. And it has to do with the distribution of the carbon, how it might happen. You can get the carbon to come out in little bits, in circles, inside the normal steel. And because it's a white carbon, this would be probably referred to as a nodular, little nodules of carbon, nodular white cast iron. Can you see that? All right. So how the carbon comes out can be influenced by the addition of other atoms. And the kind of placement of the carbon determines the property of the cast iron. But the big deal with the cast iron still remains the fact that it is low temperature castable. So how does that fit into the story of public transport, personal and public transport? Well, we can, we can generate steels that, that make pressure cylinders. That's what we were talking about before when I mentioned, you know, think about the steels in the 1800s being developed. Now you're at a point where you understand how to create specific castable steels that can either be good at shock loading. Some of them are better at shock loading. If you distribute your carbon through it, it doesn't break as easily. Some are harder if you can get more of the white carbon steel. 
So you get the iron carbide to dominate. So it's a hard material. So you can use that for a bed surface on a machine. Now it's quite simple. It's the word. Castable. Why is it that that becomes important to this sort of industry? The development of public and personal transport. You can do that, yes. You can use a mould and make the same thing over and over so you can start to crank out, crank out materials, turn them out rapidly. I've just given you a clue as to one of the things that might be castable on a bicycle. You can drop forge a cast, uh, drop forge a crank as well, and that would be yeah. better. Chinese castable cranks often break, so they're not the best. But I'm thinking more in terms of how do you make a motor car engine? What do you need? You need a cylinder that's going to be heavy enough and strong enough to withstand an explosion. You need to be able to put a piston inside the cylinder that can be pushed by that explosion. You need to be able to put a cap on the top of it and you need to be able to cool it down. They're the key problems. You can, if you made one cylinder, single cylinder, like a lawnmower engine, you can put fan vents on the outside to dissipate the heat. So your motor will have all these little bits of metal, like in blades all around it, to open up the surface area to cool down. That's pretty difficult to manufacture, but you can cast it really easily. You can cast those complicated shapes really easily. Fair enough. But when you start making motor car engines where you want to improve the horsepower by putting more than one cylinder together on a cranked engine so that they're balanced and move the crank shaft around, maybe four together, so it's a straight four cylinder crank driven motor. They could even have horizontally opposed versions, and they did. Volkswagen still have those motors available. Horizontally opposed engines. You could put them in radials so that the engines are actually around a circle. Early motor, uh, aircraft engines were done like that. And then to improve the cooling, what they did with that was bizarre. They let the engine spin. So it flew through the air at the same time as the propeller went the other way. So it was cooling itself as it did it. And then finally they just held on to it and used different sorts of cooling. And one of the cooling processes, which is still used today, is water. So how do you get a complicated shape that has a cylinder going through it, that allows for a head to go on top, that allows you to put a piston to run through it, then allows you to run from the crankcase oil to help with the piston's movement and run all the way through that structure as well, a series of holes that you can put water through to cool the whole thing down. Castable iron. iron. Now you can start to make sand castable materials where you can put all these little pieces inside that are plugs. How do you make a hollow section inside of a cast, remember? Sand casting, it's really quite simple. There's two methods that could be used, but they don't use the second method as much for motors. One was to make a wax thing inside, and then when you poured the metal in, um, the, the wax would melt, and that would help you take up the cavities within things, or create cavities for the metal to go into. Uh, so you use a wax model to pack the sand around, and that will leave cavities behind. No, you just make little plugs that go into the spaces. For example, um, you want to make a, a, a simple bearing, a bearing housing, so that you can put a shaft through to control the position. And this could be any engine. It could be on a steam engine. It could be you know, for a motor car engine. And maybe the, the cast thing, the, the, the item, is going to look a bit like this. So it's a bearing holder. And you've got, say, a hole here, that, and then a hole here. And this can have a bolt, and it locks it to a table. 
and you put your shaft or you might have a you might put another piece of metal in there that might be a bit of bronze or something that it's easy <coughs> might be sacrificial so it doesn't wear away your complex casting that's not very complex but you may have a complex one and you run a shaft out through that and so when the shaft is spinning this is locked to the table now how do you cast so you've got a hole in it so you don't have to drill you could drill it out but then you've cast all this metal just to replace it and move it away so you want to not have the metal there in the first place it'd be easier so what you do is when you make the two halves the cope and drag two halves of the casting top and bottom you make the model you make that up in wood and you press one part in so the bottom half of the so if you've got a box with sand in it and this is just make it simple the bottom half in the box so that's maybe up to there perhaps or it might even go further up and then the top half you have to be able to separate it so you need to make sure that they're not going to overlap if you turn the other side over and looked at it so that would flip over onto the top of here and you looked in there you might have that other part of the shape going on so just come across here like that so then when that sits on top it, it makes the second half reasonable all right now all you need to do to make sure that it's um, going to be able to be cast is to put something in there that sits inside like that that is easy to remove later So we make up a sand, we, we pack sand tightly together. We may even put some castable material into it to make it stay there. What about the hole in the top here? You do the same thing. You drop into there a piece of material and these are called corings. So you put something that is, allows the casting to go around the outside of it, but it's all made of sand. So you put those two things together, you pour the metal in, and it fills up all of the area where they, they ain't. Then you break it open, and then you just bang those pieces out. You put a bar in there and knock it out, because it's only sand. Now, if you want to clean it up later, you can just run a drill down through it called a ream, smooth the surface up, but you're not wasting material. Now, you do the same thing for an engine block. So, for a, let's say for a, a four-cylinder engine block, you've got a big piece of steel you want you could machine it out of a block but you want it to have places for things to happen so you you put your cylinders in uh, three cylinders i'm only gonna fit three on it then around it you have all your water holes and maybe even some oil pump oils through from the sump that'll run down past the engine keep the stuff going down the bottom um, you might even have a space for a push rod to come through that'll go up to run the crank on the top that controls the valves and all of those things are in the block, in the casting. Look up a couple of castings for car engines in the old fashioned way would be very straight blocks like that. And that's why they tended to do the straight blocks because it was easy to separate the material. Even the V8s are done pretty much the same way because you can separate the castings apart. So here's the big deal with castable steel. It allows you to create engine blocks. Now you start working out some alloying to lower the weight of the engine block. Keep the strength, lower the weight. One type of solution was the Volkswagen solution by Porsche. Put magnesium as a castable item. Downside of that is that magnesium is flammable. Mag wheels are cast magnesium alloy wheels we tend to call them alloy wheels now because we don't use magnesium much anymore the problem with having um, magnesium next to your brake pads is if the brake pads got really really hot there's a potential for you to have an issue with your mag wheels or your engine might get really hot um, it might melt and even catch fire if it got hot enough to get to release the magnesium um, I know that for a fact because I had a Volkswagen at one stage and it had the flat back engine and it burnt to the ground basically because 
someone who was driving it didn't understand that with those particular models the carburetor was sitting on top of the hot engine and if you were pumping it you, 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 you basically if you didn't know how to start it after it had flooded or started the flood you'd start pumping fuel out onto a hot engine the engine catches fire and eventually it melts your engine that was years ago years and years ago anyway so cast materials make good engines and other parts you can cast the downside of course is you may be giving up strength so you've got to start to consider what is the maximum amount of load or double the size of the material a lot of gears were cast gears because it's easy to make them on mass mass produce them and so in order to overcome the strength thing you just simply made them bigger more robust the downside of that is that they tended then to make the whole machine very very heavy okay I did mention very quickly another type of the, the use of another type of steel or cast steel the way you want it to be hard so you're trying to promote the, pre, the presentation of iron carbide and not so much of the carbon the carbon would be good for the shock resistance but and, and, but it becomes brittle um, if you start to introduce too much of uh, the iron carbon or iron carbide in the workshop there are some lathes and those lathes have been cast and the bed of the lathe is a big long flat surface and they want it to be hard why would you want the bed of the lathe to be hard who's done woodwork with me you know you've got to move the tailstock and headstock or just the tailstock the headstock stays where it is move the tailstock up and down on the slide and move the controls for where you put the um, uh, tool rests up and down on the slides so their slide ways are going to be used by other steels running up and down against it so it wants to be hard wearing so you want a hard surface if you do it by casting you need to make sure you use the right type or right kind of steel that we're going to cast steel that will give you that hard surface if you didn't cast it what might you do to get a hard surface you might want to manufacture it easily so you might want to keep it a mild steel so that you can machine it clean it up then how do you introduce hardness into the surface beat it. not beat it in because you might wreck it what's a good thing about steels again they're heat treatable okay what's all the heat treatment stuff just quickly we're gonna, so we're gonna, all of this is tied together is you got to be able to apply it to the situation heat treatment what do you remember okay so the methods are controlled heat to a point and control cooling back to a point there's also the idea of imprint imprinting into the surface other materials when you do that the term is case hardening where you in just into a certain distance you heat the material up so the surface is able to accommodate material coming in and you may produce a cool surface with material with atoms trapped in the surface alone case hardened you can do that with carburizing or nitriding nitrogen and carbon could be done by pushing into the surface generally speaking the heat treatment processes are four can you remember them there's case hardening is one separate animal altogether right? but generally speaking if you want to do the whole lot of the material no, this is heat treatment stuff. You've got to get used to the terms. Annealing is one. Right, do you remember which one's that one? All right, let's go through them then and see if we can work out which one's which. All right, hardening, tempering, annealing, normalizing. All right, we can start to eliminate them very quickly, can't you? Hardening. making it harder yeah well done hardening normalizing bringing it back to a simple condition with no other effects to worry about to a normal curve normal cooling so there's there's two easy ones hardening normalizing so we're left with annealing and tempering 
tempering. Yeah, temperature, temperament. What's your temperament like? Are you a sanguine person? Are you a, um, you know, a sort of angry person all the time? So when we talk in the English language and we talk about your temperament, we're referring to your condition and your ability to handle things. All right, so with a steel, when you temper the steel, you improve its ability to handle things. Hardening produces a problem. What's the problem? Generally, it's going to create less ductility, less malleability, and increased brittleness. The brittleness we want to avoid, the brittleness may be an issue for handling load. But if we can get rid of some of the brittleness, make it more temperate, give it a better handle on things, then it will be able to keep some of the strength that it gained from being hardened, but lose some of the brittleness that it also got from that process. So tempering then is the one where you take away the internal stress that is causing brittleness. Finally, annealing. What's left? You've made it hard. You've made it hard, but capable of handling loads. You've brought it back to its normal condition. There's only one other thing you'd like to do to metals when you're working them anyway. Annealing, making it softer. Making it softer. Yeah. Gosh, guys, this, this is basic year 11 stuff that we spent hours on. You've got to be able to handle that very quickly and easily. Because they're going to have questions in the HSC where they might talk about this is a piece of dead mild steel that has been annealed. And you then mentally you go, dead mild and annealed? That's really soft. Or this has been hardened and tempered, tool steel. And you go, hardened and tempered? Okay, that's going to be able to be used to cut other pieces of steel. Because not only is it a high carbon steel, but it's been hardened and then taken the brittleness away so now you've got really good cutting tool material. Fair enough. And if you've got a piece of metal that you want to bring back to its normalized condition so that you can start the whole process all over again, all bets are off, back to default, then you'd normalize it. Well, we'll just finish with this to see if you can remember it. Do you remember the sorts of things that have to happen in order those things take place? The differences in terms of the temperatures you take it to? Hardening, you cool it down fast, but where from? Let's from think again in the iron carbon diagram. In any diagram, any of the any of the diagrams, the iron carbon diagram is just one of the phase diagrams we looked at. One of them, okay. You have to take the take the temperature above one of the the cri critical points, the upper critical point, so you can change its structure. So you take it from down here back into, say, the austenite range. Then by cooling it quickly, what have you done? What does it want to do when it gets to that line, the 720, 727? It's now all one material, austenite, and it wants to change into the two different. Yeah, it wants to change into the ferrite and into the iron carbide. And it wants to do that lamellar layer structure. But if you bring it down too fast and it doesn't do it, it might get some of it done, it might get, it's going to be stressed and brittle. But it'll be hard because now you've got more carbon in the steel because austenite can handle more carbon in the steel and you've reduced some of the iron carbide. So you've improved some of its properties a little bit. Now you want to get rid of the brittleness that's been induced by the stress. Do you heat it back up into the austenite range? Why would you do that? You just went to the trouble of going up there and bringing it down quickly. You want to keep what you've got down here. So you don't want to go back above the, the upper critical line. You don't want to go back above that critical line. You bring it up close to it and you can sit there for a while, depending on how stressed it might be. So you keep the structure that you formed, but you get rid of the stress that the structure has. And then you cool it back down again. All right, that's cool. What about normalizing? What would you do? So you've done this, you've done a hardness, and you'd, you've tried to do it and you didn't quite get it right, so you want to go back and start again. Um, cool it down the same rate, cool it, 
uh, yeah, we're, 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 you've got to heat it first. Where are you going to heat it to? Austenite. Back into the austenite range. So that it all becomes the one thing again. Then this time, instead of rapidly cooling, bring it down close to equilibrium rate. All right? And then you'll get back to normal. And then you can try doing those other things all over again. That's cool with steel. You can do this stuff. What about the softening process? What might you want to do there? Um, really slow. Why really slow? There's two real ways you can do this. You can bring it back up in the austenite range and cool it so slow that the ferrite crystals in the lamella structure, and if you're a low carbon steel, the ferrite crystals themselves, all grow big. Big crystals tend to be softer or at least the extremes of properties, the ductility, the malleability, and so on. There's more slip planes in a bigger crystal than in little ones. They're at least in one direction. So if you did that and grew bigger crystals, then you get a softer material, generally. The other way is to just take it up to that line very close to it and leave it there for a lot longer so that the stress that's already in there can make some of the crystals recrystallize. Okay. When does those particular properties really be, need to be remembered? One of the processes for forming steels is in rolling. And you can do rolling cold, and you can do rolling hot. When it goes past the rollers, it will change the structure. It will either deform the crystals, and they'll stay deformed, or the pressure and the heat will make the crystals reform into something entirely new on the other side of the rollers. Same applies with forging. You need to be aware of the temperatures you're going to so that you don't, if you want to, particularly with forging, you want to trap a grain flow into the structure. Again, for motor vehicles, piston rods and, car and, and rods that have pressure on them, it'd be really good if in the crankshaft piston rod, so you've got the piston, and at the bottom, and, and it's hinged, and at the bottom, it's going to go onto another run to the crankshaft, and that's going to move up and down and spin and change its position. Just make sure you get some video of motors again, so you can remember how that works. This thing here, the connecting rod between the piston and the crankshaft, called con rod, connecting rod has to be strong enough to handle the changes in direction caused by getting to the top and then being pushed back down and pulling it up and down and up and down. So you'd be good if we could get grain flow to happen by forging and pushing it around. So the last thing you want to do is if you do that and you go to the trouble of getting that distorted grain into it is to then let it get hot and heated or heat treat it and lose all that and get back to equiax grains, which would then have a weakness across those areas because it's shorter distances between the grain boundaries. Remember all this? This is fine, isn't it? We good? Yeah. You've got to be able to put these things together. So when they ask you questions in the HSC about, you know, tell me something about the nature of a connecting rod for a piston in a truck or a bus. And you go, well, what's, what, I don't know about buses. And then, you know, it doesn't matter. The bus puts it into transportation. They're asking you about the metallic nature. Of, they'll probably give you a picture and show you the grain flow. And I, they'll be asking you about the grain flow, not about whether you know what a bus looks like or whether it's a truck or a car or you know, that sort of thing. Okay? It's the context. Context for cast iron. In this area, motors component parts for the motors and drive shafts and things, for the bearings, right. okay?